Point number five is the presence of blasphemy laws. So um, I, I taught for 16 years at the University of Virginia, wonderful school, and on, on many parts of, of grounds are these words from Thomas Jefferson. This institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error, so long as reason is left free to combat it. And he's basically pointing to institutionalized disconfirmation. That's the point of a university. So he's saying there will be no blasphemy laws at UV. You can say anything you want, and people will simply argue it down if you're wrong. But at a social justice university, there are many blasphemy laws. I just listed a few off the top of my head. Racism and sexism are endemic. Victims play no role in arriving at their current state. No difference of ability or interest. And affirmative action is good and more is better. So at most universities, if you disagree with any of these publicly, you can expect a very severe response. Um, now, how, why does this matter? Uh, there are lots of problems that we want to figure out. There are lots of things we want to think of. There are lots of racial inequalities. There are lots of gender inequalities. We need to understand what's going on, right? So a long-standing problem uh, is that women are underrepresented on the faculty of STEM Department of Science, Technology, Engineering. So what should we do? Well, at Harvard, um, back in 2004, I think it was, they had a conference on. This was a closed-door conference, no public, no press, to really air ideas they invited the president of the university, who's an, an economist, uh, Lawrence Summers, um, and uh, they asked him to give his thoughts. He's the president of a major university. Does he have any thoughts on why we can't get the numbers up in our STEM departments, the numbers of women? And so he gives a talk, and you can find it online. And, well, okay. Many people think that he said that women aren't as smart as men. And that's not at all what he said. In fact, I urge you to Google Lawrence Summers' uh, women in STEM um, and if you read, it's not that long. It, it is a model of careful social science thinking. Social sciences teach you to think about multiple forms of causality. It's hard to know what's what. And what he does is he comes in and he says, uh, my guess is that there are many causes. And he lists three. One of them is discrimination. Uh, but he says, well, as one of them, you know, one of the three causes could be, could be that there is a difference in the standard deviation of IQ scores. He doesn't say that Men are smarter because they're not. The IQ is the same. But the spread is different. So that at four standard deviations above the mean, there are going to be more men. So this is statistically what he's talking about. The IQ scores for women in the United States, the same mean. But the, the standard deviation is, uh, is uh, larger for males. And so if we look four standard deviations above or below, there are more men. There are more men um, at the very top and the very bottom. There's a lot of research showing that this is the case. Uh, on measures of, of uh, quantitative skills. There are some studies that suggest that maybe it's lower in other countries, maybe it's changing over time. So this could be something that will change eventually. But the point is that for recent history, for many decades, this has been true. This is the population of people we're sampling from uh, who are applying for jobs as professors of, of chemistry at Harvard. Uh, it's going to come from the top. So that could be one of the three reasons. That's what he said. One of the three. Yes, discrimination, but also maybe I mean, that's what economists do. They draw graphs. They, you know, figure out things from curve. That's what they do. What happens? Do people argue back with him? That I don't know. I, maybe somebody argued then. But the point is, there was such outrage, outrage, not just at Harvard, but around the country, that ultimately he was forced to resign. Now, he, he is a pugnacious guy who made a lot of enemies. It's not just this. But the fact that he was ultimately pushed out because of this is such a black mark, I think, not just on Harvard but on all social scientists who did not stand up for him. Because this is just such simple, obvious, straightforward, and quality social science thinking to raise that as a possibility. Because he committed blasphemy, and in fact, he violated three of those four rules. He said, he wasn't denying, but he was just saying, maybe the reason isn't just sexism, maybe there's other reasons. And he's blaming the victim. He's saying it has something to do with women. That's, you can't do that. And he said, and, and of course he's saying, well, maybe it's not an average difference, but maybe the top end so again, blasphemy, committed three forms of blasphemy with that simple argument, and that's why he got fired. Here's one other example. Um, so poverty in America uh, affects uh, children especially, and especially uh, children from Black, Native American, and Latino families. One of our biggest problems, one that most undergraduates are concerned about, one that most professors are concerned about. Um, so by a long process, I ended up, because I, I'm nonpartisan, I'm not on the left or the right, I write about this stuff, I ended up... Um, uh, chairing a, a group of uh, America's top poverty scholars from the left and the right. 
we'd come together to try to reach consensus about inequality. We failed. But in, those first me- in that first meeting, we discovered that we all were very concerned about child poverty, the transmission of poverty. And so can we get together as a, as a bipartisan group and, 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 and make some recommendations based, on the, based on, on the research? And the answer was yes. And it was fascinating. We worked together for a little over a year. Um, and right off the bat, the left wanted to focus on those three causes. The right wanted to focus on those three causes. Um, and the thing is, they're all correct. Both sides are right. It is economic and it is familial. Both sides are right. You need all of it to do it. And after a year, we came up with what I think is the best analysis of American poverty in the last 30, 30 years. And, and I think the only, well the, I, well, the best plan out there, I believe, for actually addressing it. Um, because it was, we got everybody to agree. And we even got, it was amazing. We got the right, we got the, the people on the left to actually agree that marriage is actually really, really important for understanding poverty and inequality. And we got the, uh, we got the right to actually agree to recommend birth control. Now, you have to look in the footnote and read between the lines because it was really hard to get people to agree to violate their sacred values. And people were really worried about what their colleagues were going to say, but they did it. And so we came up with a consensus report. Um, it was really thrilling to do. Uh, now, what would have happened if we had done this at a university? There are, well, there one guy, one conservative was from a university. There's one at, at NYU. But all the other conservatives were at think tanks because they can't get jobs at universities. So if this had happened just within sociology departments or economics, well, economics is different, but had it happened just at university, we could not have considered those. Those are blasphemy. You can't blame the victim. So we would have knocked those out. Now, the situation is this. Social science is really, really hard. You're dealing with situations for which you can't usually run true experiments. And you're always dealing with multi-causality about, about things that think and move. It's really hard stuff. You need a lot of tools. But what happens at Social Justice University is they say, one third of the tools, nope, nope, you cannot use them. If you touch it, we shoot you. 